Well, doing a little technical testing here. I'm going to run a... We're starting just a hair early, not actually starting. It's kind of like a preliminary uh, process that we're going to go through here. Uh, because we have a new system that uh, we're going to uh, see if we can't deploy it today. And if it works successfully, as we hope it will, uh, at that point, what will happen is uh, it will announce it on the Calcedon website, and then folks can take advantage of it. So that's the plan with that. I missed everyone coming in from the um, future Christendom conference. As it turned out, the logistics did not work out for me being part of that. Uh, part of a Q&A here because they had to get me to the airport, Philadelphia airport, and that meant that that trip had to start about the time <laughs> that the Q&A would have started, which would have been 3 o'clock uh, Eastern Daylight Savings Time. So we're going to try to make up for lost time, and uh, I think we're going to encounter a similar issue in August when I am in uh, Canberra, Australia for the Daniel 244 conference. I have uh, seven or eight lectures I'm going to give, be giving there on eight different topics, kind of a um, tour de force of the application of the faith to all these different areas. And the Australians were kind enough to have me come in, and uh, I know I will be flying in the air again on Sunday uh, when we would be doing this event. So I will alert everyone to that uh, happening too. Oh, good to see Becky's here, Nancy Wilkes. And uh, good friends uh, of long-standing supporters of Calcedon. So uh, it was a very good conference in uh, Wyoming, Pennsylvania. Uh, it, uh, what they did for the breakout sessions is have all the six or seven speakers all speaking at the same time in different rooms. So it meant you had to choose, and uh, it there was no getting around that fact that you could only pick one. Or you could do like some of the uh, folks modeling the hummingbird or the uh, hummingbird model or the honeybee model, moving from place to place and getting a little bite of each. And uh, I don't know how that's as edifying as sitting through one all the way. But the good news is that all those lectures are available on the uh, YouTube channel for the Future Christendom Conference. So that's the good news. Um, my speech was also captured and is available. Uh, there for those who would be interested in catching up on it and seeing what I had to say about the Kingdom of God, extensive, intensive, and protensive. For you, th those of you who don't know, the word protensive means extended through time. So extension is extension through space, intensive into depth, and protensive through time. And uh, that's a term I learned from Warfield, of all people, Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, in discussing First John 2.2, 2, the propitiation for the world says that uh, in his exposition of this he points out that what is missing in our analysis is the fact that there's a protensive element a, a kind of duration through time and that what was actually happening was that uh, there's a contrast between the humble modest beginnings of the church of God's work in the world and the stupendous uh, climax of that as the Great Commission is completed and so that protensive element if it's lost or missed on the shuffle you lack the understanding of how to capture what the meaning of that text actually is. Uh, I believe that exposition is made available, if I'm not mistaken, in the book Thine is the Kingdom, an anthology that Chalcedon published that Dr. Ken Gentry edited. So, I believe we are probably ready to start uh, our uh, Q&A session in earnest. And so, all the host hubbub and... Um, warming up the audience is over now <laughs> and so it's time to see if there's uh, any pending questions otherwise I have to fill the space as best I see fit oh good it's good to hear so it looks like the new feature is up online and so this test of the emergency reconstruction system was successful had this been an actual reconstructive emergency you would have been directed to your local uh, reconstructionist for advice yeah and I see Darlene uh, Rushton is in from Vallecito. Uh, she's to be credited with the fact that we even see Mark's sermons on uh, the Facebook Live. And it was the success that that garnered that allowed us to say, why don't we see you have, uh, catch this other aspect? We, because when Dr. Rushton used to do the messages, uh, he would take Q&A afterward. 
So we're kind of taking at least the spirit of the Q&A and having it after the sermon, except now we're double teaming it. Mark does the sermon and I come in afterwards and I take general Q&A on any topic. Um, if it's about the sermon, then it depends how much I got to see because I'm doing a lot of preparation prior to the sermon. So I don't catch everything that he had to say. Uh, but he has some very good points about Israel uh, being, in fact, the object of Christ's message with respect to the house that's been cleaned up and emptied and is ready for someone to move in. Just the absence of idolatry is not the same thing as the presence of God. It simply means that a different God, which is usually the self, is in place. Self-worship, will-worship, and uh, therefore it didn't do uh, Israel any good to have cleaned the house. The latter state, or as he pointed out, the word estate isn't even in the original uh, Greek. The latter is worse than the first for that man. So here's a question. Our society doesn't administer capital punishment as it should. How should families relate to family members in prison for life when they are repentant? What we have here, of course, is an opportunity that grace has extended to us in an unusual way. Uh, we can't always work out the details when what man intends for evil, in this case failure to do capital punishment, um, God can overrule that for some other purpose. Uh, if those family members are truly repentant that are in jail and in fact have a, uh, had a death sentence over their head which was commuted and made, say, a life sentence or a very long sentence, uh, then they should certainly be aware of the fact that, you know, I do deserve to die. And that's the true repentance. Now, they are not in a position to commit suicide. That doesn't fix the problem. It's on the state. The state will pay the price, the penalty. In the meantime, you have given uh, some opportunity for ministry and work to make uh, those days that you have left worthwhile in some way, shape, or form. Some people actually get out of prison even though they uh, were guilty of a capital crime and duly... Uh, prosecuted for it and convicted, and yet the state says instead of the capital crime that scripture lays out, it's going to be something else. At that point, of course, there's an appeal to heaven, and uh, God, therefore, will remand justice according to his views. We see this laid out in Isaiah 15, I'm uh, sorry, Isaiah 59, uh, chapters four, uh, letter, verses 14 all the way through to the end, but primarily the notion that uh, justice cannot be found. Uh, and truth is uh, falling in the streets, etc. And it, uh, the Lord saw that there was no man to do right, and it, just, and it uh, angered him, and therefore he took it upon himself to intervene, if you will, interpose his authority. And so in the courtroom of heaven, uh, all accounts will be made right. He reserves the right to do it now in certain forms or to uh, postpone it until the judgment day, but every single uh, ledger will be taken care of. It either can be laid at the foot of Christ for those who have his atoning blood credited to them by grace through faith, or uh, they will uh, have that forever after on them in eternity, uh, and justice will be done one way or the other. Uh, there is no more fundamental, uh, in fact, I mean, theologically we say all the attributes of God are coterminous. You cannot weigh one against the other, because that would mean that if you say God's more loving than he is just, then God is imperfectly just. You know, he's not infinitely just like he needs to be. He falls short, and therefore we always have to be careful when we try to say this attribute of God is more important than the others. They're all equally important. And most heresies arise because we uh, make these uh, value judgments. We're going to emphasize one thing over the other and say what God's really interested in is, and that doesn't quite fly all the time. That usually is a formula for further theological dislocations down the line. Once you start down this path, you're in big trouble. So that's an important point. Uh, so, but I do want to say that you, God in no way relaxes any element of justice because that would be to deny himself because he's justice incarnate just as he's truth incarnate. And he's infinitely so. So uh, that was the first question that arose. And for all I know, it was salting of the mind, and that's fine by me because it certainly starts a discussion going on. There's some additional uh, discussion related to, say, Dr. Joel McDermott's book, The Bounds of Love, which uh, takes an interesting controversial tack with respect to the capital uh, punishment laws. Uh, in his view, the harem principle dominates and should control and govern uh, our understanding of some of these capital punishments. 
and therefore things that he believes can be categorized under that uh, rubric, under that umbrella, uh, no longer have a temporal punishment executed by the civil government. In his view, the jurisdictional realm has been transferred from the earth to the heavens. In other words, God is going to directly judge uh, those things, and there will not be a capital punishment here on earth for those things. Now, two things need to be said. First, for folks who say, oh man, these guys are getting off scot-free. Uh, Joel is letting them off the hook. Dr. McDermott is way out to lunch here. Uh, that's a problem because you're saying, in effect, that God is not a good, as good an executor as men are. But it's the other way around, you see. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it's the other way around. It's a much worse thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He's a consuming fire. So uh, that's, that's a misunderstanding. Just because jurisdiction has been moved, assuming it was, just because it perhaps allegedly had been moved to the heavenly throne room doesn't reduce the penalty. If anything, you're in worse shape uh, because God now reserves the right to do all sorts of things to you. For example, there's no penalty for violating the poor tithe except that God notices it and destroys your nation for doing it. There's no civil penalty for a lot of things in Scripture. I mean, the majority don't, of them do not have temporal punishments laid out for them. God handles them all. So what Dr. McDermott has done is to move a certain things that were under capital um, temporal punishment for the civil government in the Old Testament, and he holds that they've been moved up to the heavenly throne room for their adjudication. So, uh, and of course, Andrea has made a point there, and uh, which is, but when God's sanctions are not applied, the justice factor is absent for those who were the victims. Well, see, that would also be true for the poor tithe, right? That's the point I'm making. Uh, it is a false argument against Dr. McDermott. Now, I believe there's some true arguments against Dr. McDermott's position. Uh, let's take, for example, and I'm kind of anticipating what my book review of his book is going to say, but I guess the subjects are on the open. Uh, I'm concerned, for example, with the idea of the sons of Belial. Under Dr. Rishduni's understanding, and he certainly takes it from a large amount of uh, Old Testament commentaries going way back in time, Sons of Belial are revolutionaries who are going to destroy you, your community and your government, your nation. That's their business. They are absolutely sold out in the destruction of everything. So they are your terrorists, if in effect. There is no more severe judgment in Scripture than Sons of Belial. Uh, and what they do is to undercut and destroy your nation. So to say that God no longer says you can protect your nation from absolute revolutionary action, radical revolutionary action designed specifically to destroy it, is essentially now to say um, you're on your own. You, know, you are totally open to these um, attacks. And that presents now a whole new problem, right? Because I don't think Dr. McDermott wants to say that you are an, uh, a godly government is not permitted to protect itself from revolutionary a a attacks to undermine it and destroy it. I mean, explicitly, that's what the sons of Belial are. And I would have you take a look at Dr. Rishoni's commentaries on this entire thing. So you have two choices. Dr. McDermott would have to then say, sons of Belial doesn't mean what Dr. Rishoni says. We have to then redefine sons of Belial to something far less severe than the Bible seems to indicate they are to make it uh, at least more appealing to say they don't have any, there's no civil way to stop it. Uh, you cannot restrain that particular evil, which is revolutionary evil to destroy your entire system. Uh, so he'd have to redefine sons of Belial in order to justify uh, anyone taking action, right? So that's a problem when a theory now requires redefinitions, and ad hoc, which are ad hoc additions to it, to make it fly. To say, yeah, we, uh, sons of Belial is something much, it's just a, like a, a a mental thing. They're spiritually a little out of kilter, a little heretic, a little aberrational, but not so bad that they are going out deliberately trying to torpedo the entire culture as best they can with every last ounce of their strength. But now we have a problem because now we've had to backtrack on what the biblical idea is. So if we have one problem there uh, in respect to the sons of Belial, you will certainly find other issues. Because now, uh, if Dr. McDermott is wrong on his redefinition of the sons of Belial, which I believe is going to be incumbent upon him to put forward to justify his actions, then we have uh, other issues as well. So if it falls apart for the one case, it doesn't look like it's going to work for the others, because it really is a package deal. Because if one harem example uh, 
is, runs afoul of his approach because it requires such a massive and counterintuitive uh, redefinition of sons of Belial, then uh, that means that that principle, having it in the harem package and saying if it's in this box, we can safely say jurisdiction is up in heaven now. That I don't think that's so safe to say because now you say that no culture is now able to protect itself from the sons of Belial. Uh, and the re way that it was to be done was the way that it's laid out in Scripture. So that is just a little taste of the problem, if you will, that, that, that I see here. That the sons of Belial, that alone casts some grave law, doubt, at least, on Dr. McDermott's thesis. So if anything was remanded to heaven for jurisdiction, I don't think you can use the harem laws as the pretext for doing that because... The sons of Belial are, are supposedly fall into this category, and if they do, and the sons of Belial mean anything close to what Dr. Rashduni and the commentators have said, uh, you can, that means that every single government has been handed over a death sentence uh, with this approach, because you cannot defend yourself against the treasonous actions of uh, the sons of Belial. That whole idea, what that idea means, is a key, I think, and so we have to look at that. So that's just one of many other aspects of the questions. So, uh, any other questions related to the, what Rick's saying up here today? I get a lot of thumbs up, which are encouraging, but they're not questions. But I appreciate them. Does this thesis make life in prison the only option? Well, I don't believe that Dr. McDermott has any interest in, uh, in, in incarceration of any kind. Uh, I simply believe that he th believes that the harem laws essentially are heaven to be done through heaven. Um, in other words, God's going to uh, rule providentially in, and he will uh, handle things. And we see this throughout scripture, right? It says they were removed without human hand, for example. Examples of God executing judgment directly without intermediaries. And God reserves his right to do this for certain things, uh, but it certainly looks to me that the uh, capital crimes in Scripture uh, still fall under that, that category. Interesting thing, recently I saw a, a Chalcedon Foundation post which related to the question of men and women and whether God holds men more responsible. And he said, look, there's 18 capital crimes for men and three for women. That's kind of astonishing. Um, some are trying to dispute that. But there it is. You know, you have to go exegetically and say, why is it that you believe that this thing here is different from that? Why? Why are you think it's really eighteen eighteen versus eighteen three? Now, here we have one of the world's experts on the Pentateuch, Dr. Rushtuni, weighing in on it. If we were to differ with him, at least we should uh, do so studiously and uh, with knowledge and mount a case, not just dismiss it with a wave of the hand. Say, ah, that's nonsense. Yeah, not nonsense that comes from Dr. Rashtuni's lips. It may be wrong, but we get to that assessment through a lot of hard work, you know, because you you can't fight something with nothing. You have to have a better approach than Dr. Rashtuni amounted, uh, or d d better exegesis than he might have adopted. Now then, of course, all bets are off. You know, he is a fallible man, as are we all, and therefore we're all striving for the truth, and God, of course, has not yet given us all the truth. I spoke to this uh, when I was in Pennsylvania last week. There's a promise in Scripture, I believe it's in Isaiah 58, that one day Zion shall see eye to eye. And men have mentioned that even in the course of these Q&As. And that time has not yet come. But in the meantime, we have to have an organic unity and we have to work toward that truth. But you cannot demand it because it's something that apparently God delivers in His due time or He gives clarity. And what we've seen through church history is that these solutions to these problems come over the long haul, Christology took quite a while to hammer out. Why? Because the heretics always figured out a way to squirm away from each formulation. So each formulation, each creed, each council that met had to come up with more and more ways to couch the truth more accurately and completely and seal it against attack. So it took a while from the Apostle era all the way to, say, the Chalcedon Council, 451 A.D., where we finally had a decent notion about the person of Christ that was impervious to attack, and furthermore was the foundation of Western liberty, which is one of the reasons that Dr. Rashtuni chose to uh, name his foundation after Chalcedon, what was done there. He saw that that was so fundamental to the Western worldview 
and how it was able to extend the biblical Christian view into all areas that he said, that's my, we're going to name this group the Chalcedon Foundation. So, same thing happened with, say, soteriology. It took a while to hammer that out between Arminianism and Calvinism and finally get some formulations that made sense. Uh, we're still battling questions about the origins, for example, creationism versus evolutionism and various halfway houses between. Uh, we have our convictions. We're very uh, clearly on the most conservative side of that spectrum. And eschatology is going to take a while to hammer out. So, question from Justin. How important is it to have a doctrine of the land, as RJ has in his systematic theology, for people to realize that the dominion mandate is still a current mandate? Well, that's an interesting question, the way you're phrasing it. Uh, first off, what happens when you don't have a doctrine of the land is that we become disconnected from the very thing that <laughs> we arose from. I mean, we made from the dust of the earth, right? So to suddenly say we don't need a doctrine of the land, what happens then is all sorts of horrible things. I'll give you an example. There wasn't a given doctrine of the land to Israel. You will let the land lie fallow every seven years. You will not plow it or work it. You will let it rest. That it shall have her Sabbath. Every seven years, the land has a land Sabbath. And these are required. Well, guess what Israel decided to do? Hey, we don't want to um, let the land rest. We want to work her to death. And so every they said, let's skip those Sabbaths. And so every seven years, they still work the land. They didn't give the land her Sabbath. And they, and they say, well, God hasn't judged us yet. We're off the hook. And century after century happened. Five centuries went by, and God didn't let the hammer fall. So they figured, God's winking at this. God wasn't serious about his land theology. And guess what happened? Jeremiah announces, My land shall have her Sabbath, saith the Lord. And so out you go. They were all ejected into Babylon, so that the land would lay fallow for the 70 missed Sabbaths. Seventy years, the land was not worked, so that the land shall enjoy her Sabbaths, as Jeremiah said. So for us to say a land theology is not important today, is fundamentally to say we're going to cruise for the same bruising that Israel got. And of course, we do exactly that. We are as uh, uh, wicked in respect to the use of the land against God's laws as we are with respect to money. You know, across the board, we have reconstruction to be done. Uh, literally, there's every aspect of thought has been infected and contaminated with this um, dereliction of this dismissal of God's judgments. You know, who is God? I don't see him doing anything about it, so we'll do what we see fit. And this always mounts disaster. It's just that God reserves his right to punish when he wishes. You know, you think you're off the hook, but you're not. Societies uh, don't realize the, di the day of their visitation, so to speak, and that it comes inevitably. We don't know the timing of it. I think this has been a big mistake lots of Reconstructionists would make, saying, oh, we're going to see a huge economic collapse because we can't sustain this uh, giant inflation engine any longer. And so we call the shots. You know, we name the and date the dates. And that gets us in trouble. Because all we can be certain of is the certainty and the inevitability of God's judgment. We cannot name when it's going to happen because men, yeah, I think this is a verse that we can find in Ecclesiastes, I think it's 729. God made man upright, but man sought out many inventions, many devices, many machinations, many schemes. And so our scheming uh, uh, God sometimes gives us enough rope to hang ourselves with. And why does this happen in economics? I'll tell you why. Because the longer you wait to have your depression, which is your recovery phase of your economy, the worse it's going to be, the more painful it's going to be. So if God lets you get away with uh, continuing to tamper with your money supply, uh, all, it's going to do, all it's doing for you is making the final comeuppance, the judgment, worse. You see, earlier, sooner judgment is more graceful. You know, Better be to correct it early, than late, because later, sometimes uh, you're going to pay a much higher price. Here's a question we got from the Chalcedon website, which is extraordinary because that's something new, and I don't see the whole question, which bothers me. There are some cases in Scripture where justice was executed by individuals, yet Dr. Rashtuni always spoke against private individual, I guess the th thing would be jurisdiction or judgment or, or, or execution. Uh, that is correct because there, for example, the death penalty is denied to the family. The family, per se, cannot actually execute. However, when you have the, see if we get the rest of it, why were things considered righteous then? And where would be the rest of that quotation? Let's see if the see more will work. Not so now. Oh, well, 
I wish we had a, an example of this so that we can actually examine it. Uh, if we're talking about, for example, deliverance like Ehud or JL, those folks, uh, thank you, I got the whole thing now. Uh, those folks were acting uh, as deliverers from oppression. And at that point, uh, extraordinary means may be necessary to pull us out of a bad spot. Uh, there's, there's, everything's being under defend, and you would have to have a situation where the life of, of the nation was at stake. Uh, so it's, under this instance, you can have deliverers, to use Obadiah's term, or saviors, uh, that um, rise up and judge the Mount of Esau. That's the language used in Obadiah. So that's where we have to go for that. Is this the general rule? Absolutely not. You have to have that tyrant scenario. You had to have the uh, Eglon, king of Moab, you know, literally uh, oppressing Israel in a most grievous way. And so God then sends the Benjamite, Ehud, in, and they don't detect the knife on him because he's left-handed. They don't know this. Uh, so in he goes in such a way as that he can deliver uh, Israel from the oppression. Notice, by the way, that these deliverances weren't very long in lasting because Israel was still in sin. Therefore, the promise that is laid out in Isaiah, no, I'm sorry, Leviticus 19, that says, if you keep these laws, the, the sword shall not go through your land. Well, they had the sword going through the land. They had oppressions. And these were essentially self-inflicted. God's saying, I can't keep my promise because you've got to keep yours. Because you refuse to honor me and you refuse to uh, keep my laws, then you've opened up your border as a sieve to external attack and internal um, uh, problems, you know, insurrections and whatnot. Oh, Jed Shirley asks, piggybacking on the question from the website, is the Avenger of Blood no longer valid after reading Romans 12 to 13 considering, concerning personal vengeance? Uh, yeah, I would say that there's a, certainly a sense in which uh, the civil magistrates are set for the purpose of having the sword. The church is not to have the sword, and uh, all taking of life must be lawful. And what we have now is that the, the sword is given specifically uh, to the civil magistrate. In fact, that's the only function the civil magistrate is allowed to have, um, and it is to enforce the, uh, the laws of Scripture. The Christian courts were to handle all other th accounts. So, this raises the question, do we need to have cities of refuge, or is there such thing as an equivalent of a city of refuge in the modern era? And some would argue, yes, we perhaps we should have such things as Levitical cities of refuge today. Others would say they're all expired with that system. But the principle of the city of refuge has some merit, and Dr. Rashtuni does discuss this at length in his commentaries on the various passages that relate to these cities of refuge. An interesting side note about cities of refuge. It was required by Israel that they build roads to them so that would be very easy access to get to them. Now think about this. From the environmentalist lobby, they object to construction of roads because when you construct roads, you obliterate habitat. Uh, but here, God's requiring it. So Dr. Calvin Beisner, in his interesting book, uh, Where Garden Meets Wilderness, uh, points out that the construction of roads in Levitical cities show that God has sanctioned for certain purposes the destruction of habitat for his purposes. That's an interesting insight uh, and shows that some folks are willing to plumb the scriptures a little bit farther than others. A comment was made over the weekend that Dr. Restorney was a preterist. Can you explain Dr. Restorney's position regarding that issue? Certainly. Dr. Restorney always felt that we needed to have the best possible approach to all of Scripture. So he might have his own personal convictions and put them in writing and support them throughout the body of his work. And in respect to the book of Revelation, he was not a preterist. He did not hold that it was written prior to 70 AD, nor that the events in it all primarily were fulfilled up through 70 AD, the Vespasianic War. He was what's known as an idealist. In his view, the book spoke about the entire inter-advent period, composed of about approximately seven consecutive visions that embraced that entire period. And that was uh, his view, and it goes back to Warfield and other scholars that he adopted it. And he had objections to certain uh, preterist hermeneutics. Now that said, remember the first point I pointed out, he said he supported all research, and there's still plenty of plausible things to be said 
for all these positions. So he was willing actually to fund some preterist research, despite being opposed to it. Now, talk about a man who put the kingdom of God first before his own preferences theologically. That's big. Most folks will only capitalize what they personally believe in, not something that they oppose. But he believed that eschatology had not yet been shaken up properly, and though he was always a post-millennialist, uh, he felt that as long as there was something plausible to be said on the other side, it ought to be said, and we ought to hear it and give it a, um, a, a hearing in the court of Scripture. And so he actually had financially supported, in some cases, the production of preterist material, though he himself was not a preterist. So that's important to say. And consequently, maybe it makes sense that a lot of uh, preterist post-millennialists cite Dr. Rushtoni, but I don't think they cite him because he's a preterist. And they cite him because he's a post-millennialist. Dr. Gentry put it very well. He says, I'm a post-mill first and a preterist second. I think if that emphasis is uh, ours, we'll be in pretty good shape. Because post-millennialists, if they're going to be fighting each other over a uh, historicist, and I'm a idealist, and I'm a preterist, um, partial preterist, of course, then, of course, we are thin on numbers to start with, so then to be you know, clubbing each other over the head in the meantime is not good. So I maintain very good relations, to the best of my ability, with uh, preterist post-mills. We have honorable discussions, and we can challenge each other on various aspects of the Book of Revelation. That said, Dr. Rush Tooney was very much a preterist when it came to Matthew 24, and you can tell that's the case because he wrote the foreword to the book In Eschatology of Victory, which was a collection of J. Marcellus's Kick's writings, his commentary on Matthew 24, on Revelation 20, uh, Prophecies of Isaiah, and other things on this order. So uh, Dr. Rush Dooney supported that approach, at least to the Olivet Discourse. Nowadays, in, among Christian Reconstruction circles, we find dispute about where we should divide the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. Should it be divided at verse 34 of the 24th chapter, like Kick and others have done? That seems to be a popular way to go. It certainly, uh, here's a case again where Dr. Rushton wrote the foreword to the book that says, split it here. That means that uh, if that's the time text and everything before that happened and everything after that may be referring to the uh, second coming at the end of the world and not to the destruction of Jerusalem within the generation past. So that's one approach. The other approach is to say, no, that's not quite right, because the parallel passages over in Luke tell us and give indications that Jesus is still on the same track past that verse, all the way to Matthew 25, 30. That, in fact, Jesus doesn't answer the question about the end of the world until Matthew 25, 31, where the white throne appears and the, and the Lord on it and all the nations standing before him. Then we are at the end of the world. Everything else before that is still referring to the... Um, it's a pre-70 AD scenario, preterist, if you will. So here's a case where folks like Dr. Rush Dooney and myself and other scholars would be preterist, very much so, with Matthew 24, and even a good chunk of 25, and yet not be preterist with Revelation. We simply don't see that Revelation is speaking about the same things. Others do. Others, folks, have gone so far as to say, you know, here's the big apocalypse in Revelation, and here's this little apocalypse, say, in Mark 13. David Chilton was famous for saying that their little apocalypse covers the same ground as the big apocalypse. And that makes for a great phrase, facile, if you will, but you have to go deeper to see if that's true or not. And that's what I always try to drive other folks to do, and Rushtoni would drive folks to do. Dig deeper. You don't, don't just do the surface or accept the, um, what do I call it, the conventional wisdom out there. Believe me, eschatology has not been nailed down. In my personal opinion, Dr. North did a tremendous disservice to David Chilton when he announced that he was the finest commentary in Revelation ever written. It forever, you know, in other words, it's, it's, he virtually announced it as being canonical. Uh, and he, and he, he opened up, you know, he figured out the solution to the problem of who the beast was, things in this order. And so this huge... Uh, promotional uh, flood over this book and come to find, of course, that not many people accepted it as, as what it was pre uh, purported to be. Most of us found uh, problems with it, though it certainly was an interesting stab 
and it causes us to think about a few things with respect to the preterist interpretation of Revelation, the idea that it covers the events primarily up through 70 AD. And some people will stick it all the way to Masada and have reasons for that. Nonetheless, the point is preterist first century fulfillment. So what happens when we make the statement that this is the finest commentary, you know, say, we've arrived, we don't have to look anymore, someone solved the problem. Well, the solution to the problem is very much similar to th solutions that have been offered for um, centuries before. There's uh, nothing novel in what Dar uh, David Chilton put together from that point of view. And the other point is that it, it makes an assumption that we are able to, as I say, uh, finally close the door on a major locus of this eschatology when 20 centuries of Christians have been able, able to do so. One man single-handedly did it, and Dr. North funded it. Uh, the likelihood of that being true is pretty much zero. It contributes to the discussion in many areas. It certainly extends, in some areas, the preterist case. In my view, it still doesn't um, make it conclusive. So I'm what I'm what's called a, a sympathetic critic to that view. I believe it is uh, what we see that Dr. North was doing is always putting it on the pedestal of certainty, you know, preterism, boom, especially Chilton's book. And I think it needs to be moved from the pedestal of certainty to the modest dais of plausibility. It's a very different thing. So. Uh, because anything can be challenged at any point, starting with Nero is the beast. Once we say, oh, well, you know, here's the 666 in Hebrew, that's, that's all you need to know, it, it, it fits. No, it doesn't, because Nero and Kaiser, the um, title, uh, is lacking the letter of the Yod. When spelled with the Yod, it's 676. So the earlier uh, spellings that we've been found, say in the Nabothian Pilon in 48 AD, show the spelling with the yod. So what happens when people hear this, the preterists, they say, well, I didn't say it was the spelling, it's a spelling. Well, a spelling of anything perhaps can be manipulated to become uh, 666. So there are all sorts of issues already with the number, uh, apart from the fact that you have the question of the final nun uh, being present, whether that has the 50, should it be 616 or 666? That all depends. Uh, so it's more complex than they say. And so I don't want, like seeing things packaged in such a way as to say, here's the answer, because what books like this do, uh, if they don't give all the alternatives, are doing what's called special pleading. In other words, taking all the strong evidence and kind of soft-pedaling the things that are contrary to their views. And that way you don't get the benefit of the whole picture. And if you are raised only in a preterist post-mill scenario, you may never have read that there were other post-mills who had a completely different view and perhaps they were right and the preterist view was incorrect. So, good catching up all of them. I think I study, I'm not, I'm an idealist myself, I got to rush to any, but I study the historicists as well as I study uh, the preterists because all are worth studying and all have something to say, but only one of them can be right. I don't think it makes sense to say that they all can be right. So, huge issue there. We said more folks join for today's, today's Q&A. Any other questions besides these highly technical eschatology ones? I'll take more of those because I certainly know the material well enough. But <clears throat> it's going to make me a one-note uh, pony here, uh, a Johnny one-note, just talking about eschatology. Jed asks, how does delegation of authority work when it comes to raising children? If they belong to the family, what are the limitations? Oh, goodness, I have to pass, push that down. J Justin just got in front of you. If they belong to the family, where are the limitations on who and why you may seek out others, even private schools, if passage? Okay, I can't see the rest of that, but I get the gist of it. Basically, you cannot um, delegate your responsibility. So the delegation, uh, Rushton actually has an interesting example of it. When a woman turned over uh, her son for schooling, and she said to the person, and the Rushton is quoting this, the flesh is yours, but the bones are mine. See. So in this point, the fundamental structure of the child's character is the parent's responsibility. So you, when you delegate, you still retain the responsibility. Uh, and it's important, therefore, that if you delegate, you verify that you're delegating to someone who is trustworthy and, in fact, embodying your worldview and inculcating the same values that you would in the child uh, so that <clears throat> you're not getting uh, sold a bill of goods, so there's not subversion going on behind the scenes. So that is the only time where it is legit. So this context question normally comes up with Christian schools versus homeschooling. In homeschooling, of course, the parents are directly responsible for the education of the children. In Christian schooling, you find a school that fits 
uh, your a mission statement that works for you, that the teachers are on the same page with you theologically, etc., and uh, and the goals match up, and you have a way, of, uh, and there's an accountability mechanism, if you will, so you can verify that your choice has not been subverted. And so you can, in fact, uh, delegate uh, that responsibility at that point. Uh, from one point of view, it was delegated in Israel. Levites, the Levites were responsible for teaching. Uh, the people shall find knowledge at the lip of the Levite, right? I think that's the gist of what Malachi's comment is in the second chapter. Oh yeah, uh, do passages such as Deuteronomy 6 seem to limit it to the, the family. Uh, the responsibility is to the family. And of course, uh, if the family's not doing it, it's totally delegated and says, I'm going to check out of being a father and we're going to check out of being parents and whether someone else raised them in the faith, that doesn't fly. So strictly speaking, the schooling is going to be a limited part, perhaps uh, with respect to um, aspects, the academic training, uh, things on this order, but not the spiritual training. You know, the the raising and, and the knowledge of the commandments of God, which are described primarily in Deuteronomy 6, are the parents' full responsibility. The school at best can augment that, but the core is with the parent. And that's why Dr. Rashuni quoted that fascinating comment by that old woman who gave her child to the schooler, the educator, telling him the bone, the, the flesh is yours, but the bones are mine, of the child. So you can manipulate certain things, but the core of the child, my responsibility, and that includes uh, the character, which means the uh, obedience to God's law. Okay, and Ford said something, I can't see the whole thing, it's just chopped off with one line. The information was in the, oh yeah, that's right. That's true. Lots of the information in the um, the sermons were in the uh, the, the Q and A's afterward, where Dr. Rashtuni would uh, take all questions on topic or off topic. Uh, he would try, of course, to make them topical by saying, "Any questions on our lesson?" <laughs> and he'd take those. And then he says, "Any other questions?" Which meant perhaps off topic. And there were plenty of those too, because people were sitting there in Dr. Rashtuni's presence and wanted perhaps to pick his brain and publicly. All right, and something else keeps popping up and down. Let me find. Justin, Justin, I didn't get the whole thing. Something about wealth. Right, and I, and Ford finally, for those who see this feed better than I do on my horizontal screen, uh, and the audio series of lectures on Revelation contain a lot of stuff in the QAs where you can pick up a lot more than are present in the book uh, Thy Kingdom Come, commentaries on uh, Daniel and Revelation. And, and Ford has been having a grand old time with the group studying through that. Uh, so what we really would be in our best interest to do is to try to uh, capture all of that in those audio and uh, reduce it to a form that people could read it. But until that time, get a hold of those lectures. They're certainly available online. Let me see, Justin, did you have a question? I saw one coming up, and if we can, um, maybe Andrea could uh, reassert it so I can address it. I'll go backwards and see if I can find, well, it won't even let me scroll, there it goes. Regarding wealth, many Reformed folk are against having, and that's where the question ends. So I'd like to see the rest of that question. Having something. In the mean, oh. They've already explained the, uh, the preterist issue there, Gary, so I think over the last 10 minutes I've discussed it, in fact. And the Dr. Rashtuni was not a preterist, and uh, I participated briefly in the thread where that came up, and I couldn't understand why the individual was propounding it. I think he was trying to use a guilt by association or something. I. I can't even fathom. It's certainly not his real name that he's uh, publishing under. Okay, let me see if there's a way. Having... Okay, you're pinning something. See if I can see the whole... Okay. Having excess money due to all the negative scriptures regarding money as well as the prosperity gospel. Shouldn't the reformers seek to own businesses, be entrepreneurs, have money saved for, like, presumably, the future, and laying up a inheritance for your children, which is required. To fail to do that, of course, is a, is a big deal in Scripture. So, yeah, we have a lot of emotional 
stuff related to our Neoplatonic notions that have contaminated Christendom with respect to money. And so that is why Dr. Rushtuni wrote that book, Larceny in the Heart, uh, originally entitled The Roots of Inflation. I myself typeset the original version of it, so I know what's in it and what he was trying to drive at. And then we have this excellent lecture series that's available on the website um, uh, about economics, right, in the future. Uh, and we need to have more awareness of what, how, because he talks about how the Christian can be victorious through economics. Economics is known as the dismal science, and what Christian Reconstructionists have done essentially is bring it back to the front, onto the front, front burner, and g breathe, in, breathe new life into this area, which is crucial to understand, because if you don't get money right, you don't get anything right. So part of the problem is, of course, that the money already is, is problematic, because the money that we have is an abomination. According to Scripture, you're not allowed to have it in your purse, because it is fluctuating in value, because it's a fiat currency that's being continually manipulated by government fiat and policies, things on this order. In the very next uh, Faith for All of Life, there's an article by Ian Hodge about Chalcedon and its impact on economics. You should it's at the printer and should be coming out very shortly. Check your mailboxes or check the website for Ian Hodge's article. Uh, he passed away last year, but these are articles that uh, were submitted before that time and are still as valuable as ever. So here's the problem with the government and being involved at any level with government with money, because money should really be a free market phenomenon where people again can observe the biblical laws in respect to money. Uh, and what that, that entails, I'm seeing all sorts of messages coming up, so sometimes they derail my line of thought. Uh, for example, in, the scripture encourages savings and discourages debt. What does the government do and what do banks do? They encourage debt and discourage savings. Uh, why? Because if you save, they will tax your, the interest on it. And if you uh, go into debt, they'll let you write off those uh, the interest. Uh, it was done more extensively in the past. Now, basically, is certain debts alone are, can be written off. Mm, student loan debts, mortgages, things in this order. But what this does is encourage debt. And that's disastrous because to be indebted is to be a slave. So the scripture always equates indebtedness with slavery and your to desire to be free. For those folks who think that you know the New Testament is less severe on, the, on all issues like this, more gracious than the Old Testament, you're wrong. Because in the Old Testament, you're allowed to contract a debt for up to six years. And in the New Testament, the law seems to be more restrictive. Oh, no man, anything. So, if anything, the New Testament has intensified the principles of the Old. So, you know, be free. Stand fast in liberty wherewith Christ set you free. And that includes monetary liberty. So, to work to get yourself out of debt is the first thing. If you're in a hole, don't keep digging, as the saying goes. So, work to get out of the debt. And every step that you're out of debt... You do several things. One, you're freeing yourself. Two, you're destroying the government's uh, debt system because our money is built on debt. So when you get out of debt, you yourself are doing at the base level, the foundational level, you are reconstructing things. You are changing the way the government works because that debt is no longer accessible uh, for the government to use and manipulate for its government purposes, most of which are not consistent with the kingdom of God. Most of them are in terms of usurping the prerogatives of the kingdom of God. And that happens because the kingdom people have, uh, are derelict in their duties. So the government has taken over lots of responsibilities that the Christians have basically shoved off on them through being lazy and slothful and uh, not loving the neighbors themselves, if you will. So, all that to say, our approach to money is, is completely corrupted. And that's why the book was retitled, Larceny in the Heart. There's a chapter in Dr. Richney's book by that title, and it's a very telling chapter. He points out that... Folks want to live in an inflationary society. They might squawk and, oh, prices are going up, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, if they had to pay off their mortgage in more expensive dollars rather than cheaper dollars, they'd scream like a stuck pig because, oh, no, I'm being harmed now. I want to pay off the debt in cheaper dollars. I want to borrow uh, 10000 and I want to, uh, when I pay it back, I want those dollars to be worth 9000 because of inflation, see? So when the purchasing power of the dollar is dropping, that means that you're transferring wealth to the debtor and away from the creditor. So the debtor, debtor benefits. And that's why the arsty in the heart is what's that heart. You want to steal from other people. And Christians want to steal from other people who adopt this approach, that they don't want to have a deflation. Oh my gosh, there's a deflation. What a disaster that is for me, because I have 
um, built my house on theft, which is what um, inflationary currencies are. They're a form of theft. Dr. Rushton took a lot of heat for pointing out that the government is responsible for theft when it does fractional reserve banking and things in this order. So much so, and you can read about it in the Institutes of Biblical Law, that the OPC individuals filed charges for him saying, you cannot say that the government is guilty of theft, is stealing. Uh, you must obey and submit to the government. You're mal maligning and blaspheming the government. Therefore, you should need to be defrocked. So that just shows how compromised our Christian walk is when someone expositing scripture in its proper application is to be defrocked because someone there is going to protect the government's right to uh, flood the land with bad money and to entice all of us to participate in it. So the government is very much not interested in competing currencies. Uh, the Liberty Dollar, which prevailed here in the Austin area of Texas for a while, they figured out a way to uh, throw the man in prison who set this silver-based currency in motion, uh, saying it looked too much and was claiming to be U.S. money, if you will. They couldn't even put the word liberty on it. So they found some technicality to say these silver coins being stamped, we can throw you away and lock it with you know, throw the key away and lock you up. Uh, that's why other efforts to come up with an alternative currency are, are current as well. And I spoke to this issue um, in connection with a passage in Leviticus, I think, 1913, about when should wages be paid. Scriptures indicated that the employer, he shall not keep the wages till morning that are earned for the day for that worker, and he's to be paid the day he had it. And so I had an opportunity to do an exposition of this in that lecture, which, as I said, is available at the Future of Christendom YouTube page. Links for that are also available at uh, the Facebook site for Future of Christendom. So all that to say, uh, if you don't understand the biblical ideas about money, and most of them are found in the Old Testament, then you will be the prey of folks who are going to manipulate your ignorance on this matter. And, they'll, and they will essentially manipulate you into further slavery of various stripes, and all of them are harmful to you. They're harmful to the family. They're harmful to your future. Uh, taxation policy is also related to money as well. So it's not money itself that's evil. It's the love of money, and it's the root of many evils. Uh, there's a shocker in the book, Larceny in the Heart, where Dr. Rushduni does what I call the uh, Rushduni Blunt Translation of St. Paul, where we all know the verse, you know, the the love of money is the root of all evil. And I would suggest folks actually read up how Dr. Rushdini translates that. The word evil is kakos. And there's a more gritty interpretation of that word, translation of the word, and Dr. Rushdini seizes upon it and actually says it right. Uh, but it's unprintable, uh, at least, or at least unspeakable here for me uh, in this Q&A session. I don't happen to use that word, but Dr. Rushdoni says it fits, and he put it in. His, and I asked him, because I was the typesetter of the original version, are you sure you want to put this word in here? You're going to get a flack for it. He says, it's the right translation. I'm not going to soft pedal what God has said. I'm not going to candy coat God's words. So there it is. Uh, so it's online for free to read, Larson the Heart, at the Chalcedon website. Check it out. Check out the uh, citation from Paul. Let's see if there's any other questions coming up. That question keeps coming up. That's the same question. Right. You, and I think this is, this is huge. Christians are to be productive members of society. Capital is a tool that the kingdom of God can be used to build. And you build the future. And the future is going to be built on, on capital as proper use. Proper use means that all the laws of God are being applied to the use and acquisition of capital. So the employers or employees are treated the way the Bible it requires. And the employers are following through. Uh, the laws of God respecting poverty, gleaning, things in these order, are all being applied to the ex best of our ability with the extension of general equity to these principles. All these things uh, come to mind and uh, allow us to, to build for the future. If you're not, then of course you are impoverishing the future and you are parasitic. And that's not the Christian way. 
uh, we are to find ways to serve our fellow man, and that means to uh, expand the range of dominion. That's what dominion really is. It's lawful, uh, continual, taking every thought captive that begins to Christ, and extending our reach with better tools, better means. Uh, and the kingdom of God will be, can make use of these tools. They're not satanic tools. It's a matter of how you use the tool. Let's see. If I, there's a Nancy Wilk asks, in addition to home education, health and welfare, family economics, senior care, and what else are the areas of family responsibility? That certainly covers a lot of them. And certainly in respect to... Welfare is already covered, so in, in that sense, the Proverbs 31 woman, she stretches her hands out to the poor, uh, and I think this probably goes beyond the poor tithe, per se, because it's something that she apparently does on a more regular basis. So that's above and beyond the requirement of God that already would have solved poverty. So apparently what that woman is doing is going above and beyond because others are not, and even doing the bare minimum of what God's law requires. Uh, so there's an area where the family is, is working. Uh, you mentioned family worship would also be a good one. Senior care. Uh, that, that's pretty broad there, too. It looks like you've covered most of the bases there, Nancy. Uh, but if others come to mind, I've certainly uh, anything that the state doesn't do, the family has to do because the fundamental government, to overall things as Rector would always say, is family government. So it's not the state that's fundamental, it's the family. Yeah, and. Uh, there's a lot of the point of the sovereignty of the family in the book Sovereignty. We actually did a, a study on the book. I don't even know if that's going to show up correctly, because when I look at it on online, it's in reverse, so it looks like it's off, and that's not the way the book is written. But uh, somewhere on the Chalcedon site, we have the uh, Book of the Month Q&A, and I do talk about the family aspects. Someone would like me to expand on family worship. <laughs> Basically, this has to do with the notion of the priesthood of all believers and the notion that the father is the priest over the home. And he basically uh, is responsible before God to ensure that his children are raised according to the oracles of God. It's that simple. And to gather them together to worship and pray and study his word. Uh, and all that is well and good, but meaningless if he's a hypocrite and his example is miserable. So family worship has to first start with the man being repentant, himself being re reconstructing all that he's doing, and inviting his family to join in the process so his children then can see with their own eyes that he's walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Uh, so that's, that's a very important aspect of family worship, is that litur the liturgical element, uh, even in the home, is going to be as hypocritical as in a ch derelict church if the father is not on target with God himself. Therefore, he can teach by example. There's no more profound mechanism by which you teach than by example. Uh, they say those who can't do teach, and this is a really bad <laughs> reflection on teachers if they're the ones who can't do. And that's especially true in the family. The father says, don't do as I do, do as I say. Right? Or the obverse, do as I say, not as I do. That simply means that the dad is um, <clears throat> institutionalized hypocrisy in the family. And guess what? That transmits very well to the next generation. They're more than happy to follow dad on this key note, that being a hypocrite is great because uh, I can then lord it over others and not be responsible myself. We complain that Congress makes laws that they themselves won't obey. So why are you going to go ahead and uh, provoke your children to wrath with similar things? So. I'm all for family worship when we have the foundation in place for it. Uh, it should coordinate well with the church worship where it is. Uh, it should not be in conflict with it, but of course, if the, uh, the churches are all corrupt in your area, it falls to you now to create, in essence, a home church. And perhaps other families will come and join so that your family worship becomes a little bit bigger than that. Uh, but one should always say the family is responsible for itself. It governs itself. And one of the ways it governs itself is with a uh, sending the truth into the next generation, injecting, if you will, those values. Even in this area, Dr. Rashtuni had a comment to make. It's held, he said, and this is in the Sovereignty Book, and we deal with it in that Q and um, the Book of the Month Club discussion that Andrea posted here, that the state represents reason, and so its coercion, by definition, is reasonable, and any other coercion is unreasonable. 
So they see a Christian parent raising their kid with Christian values as unreasonable coercion. You're coercing this child. And it's because it's not the state doing it, it's unreasonable and wicked and evil. So we have to realize that there's a battle here between the secular state, which has taken upon itself the sovereignty which God alone has, as critique of parents raising their children as they see fit in the faith, with all the oracles of God in place, and raising them up to be wise uh, stewards of the intellectual tools and capabilities that God has endowed them with. See, So this is a big area. Are you coercing the child? The state thinks you are. And as far as you're concerned, you're trying to liberate the child from the state and from anything that gets between him and his God. And so uh, you're promoting the child's best interest by teaching them the truth. And the state resents this deeply, and, would, uh, and that's why it's illegal in <laughs> Germany to homeschool, and why England came so close, at least I think twice, to making homeschooling illegal. They don't want any aspect of training to be left to the parents. So at least we have options in America still, and that's a blessing. Uh, few take advantage of it, and I've spoken to about why is it that our rate of homeschooling and Christian schooling has slowed down. We, why did we lose the momentum? We spoke about that thing two weeks ago, because we had the one-week break. Jed asks, are there any resources you could recommend as helps for understanding biblical child discipline? Uh, that's a very, very good question. The pendulum is always swinging on this one, too because you have the two poles of um, lenience and excessive legalism, if you will, harshness. And one, might, might, one needs to navigate this and realize there's a point where lenience is harshness. And, and where does that happen? Because you know the, the child's going up crooked and not straight. You're, you know, so your obligation is to, within the power that you have, and get the mother early and, and will pay attention to you, uh, to, to work with them. And I think you know, two, three years old is a good place to start. Uh, and I think a fundamental principle that is pretty important, and uh, at least it's worked, uh, I don't want to use a pragmatic argumentation, but I'm saying in a sense that it seems to have value, is that the one thing the child needs to be disciplined for is disobedience, because then to teach them to obey prepares them to obey God. Uh, and that's that's uh, the starting point. So the by learning to obey within the context of the self-government of the Christian family, they learn their own Christian self-government under God. It prepares them. The training wheels can come off then more easily. <clears throat> so what you are providing are the training wheels the entire time so that they can move through life uh, directed in the correct path. If you've done everything right and they still veer off after you release them, that's on them at that point. You need to have a clear conscience about this stuff. But if you were lenient and let them... Uh, sin. If you were like uh, Eli with his sons, you're in big trouble. So we can see a biblical example where uh, correction was not applied properly, and the results were laid to the father. And you don't want to be in the shoes of Eli, unless you want to be fat and die by falling over. Uh, not my way to go. So uh, better to be in a place where you your sons are um, a pleasure to you, and not a, a grievance to you, like. Proverbs talks about you know the rebellious sons and the mother's reaction to that. You can get to that place if the discipline is not balanced, if it's not if it's too far one way or the other. Looks like we are done for the week, so I will see everyone next week. Uh, looks like we'll be announcing availability of these um, Facebook Live broadcasts uh, through the face the Calcedon website proper. That was what we were testing here today. So uh, it's going to be a very uh, interesting proposition to see if it expands uh, our outreach with respect to these Q&As. Appreciate all the questions. They're always stimulating. Uh, same to you guys. Uh, we'll catch up with you all, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Take care. God bless. Bye.